So temples were a staple in the first century. Even small towns often had a temple to some god or other, and they all knew the drill. You went to the temple to make sacrifices, to worship, to pray. Um, there might be some less it's wholesome activities in place there too. Temple prostitution was a thing. Um, and your god might not actually always be in the temple, but at least his or her representatives would be. Now, the Jews were rather odd because they only had one temple for their god. The Greeks and the Romans had many temples for god, although there would be the big temples in certain places. But the Christians, they were really, really weird because they didn't have a temple. Now, honestly, at the time this letter was written, even if they were going to have a temple, they might not have it because they're a real small group and it's not always safe for them to gather publicly. But even later, when it was safe, no temple. It's very confusing. God had turned the whole religious system up on its head because there was a temple, but it wasn't made with physical stones. The cornerstone and the capstone, they were Jesus, who was the living stone. And the walls and the windows and the ceilings and the floor, those were all made up of little human stones, not the stone like Jesus, little Stonelets, us, human people, each of us individually designed to go into a certain spot in this vibrant living temple where the spirit of God dwells. Now there's, there's one verse in the Bible that talks about our individual bodies being the temples of God and it's plural. All of the rest of the times when it talks about that, including this one, it talks about us united. So we all kind of got to pretend we are in Texas because these are y'all, y'all words. Um, y'all are the temple of God. Y'all gathered, y'all scattered. That's where God dwells. We who were once in darkness, we who were once not a people, we who once had no mercy are now united the temple of the living God. And we are priests, royal priests. We are a chosen nation. We are a chosen race and a holy nation and God's special people. Peter is just merrily mixing his metaphors here. Very poor English. But he's trying to give us a glimpse of our value, of our, oh, pause. Oops, that's pushing it off completely. Let's see here. See if that's a little better. <laughs> These are really very tricksy. Okay, does that sound better? Yes. Okay, thank you, Natalie. So, <laughs> yes. Okay, um, so Peter is trying to give us a glimpse of our value, of our role in the world, and also our unity. It is really easy to look at the church and get discouraged. We are made up of broken people and we fail in so many ways. And we bite and we bicker with each other and with outsiders. But what Peter wrote is how God sees us. It is our true identity. Do we have flaws? <laughs> oh yes, yes we do. But God takes those flaws into account as he designs his temple. And even our flaws are going to be part of the beauty when we see the fullness of what he has accomplished, the cathedral that he has made. So y'all, 
We need to really cling to the truth of what God has declared. We are, we are his precious beloved church. And we need to walk in that truth and to walk with hope and joy and courage as we have our voices and as we have our lives that proclaim his excellencies. In, in 2.11, Peter declares, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Now, you remember last week we talked about the fact that in 1.1, Peter is making the point, yes, you don't actually fit in anymore. You have become strangers and exiles in your own homeland. But, but you belong to a new place and a new family, and a new God, and it is phenomenal. Well, here he adds another word. Um, it's often translated sojourners, and he spins it in a different direction. This time it emphasizes, but this is where you live. Um, and um, he's sort of answering the question, okay, how do we live for God, right where I really am. And that's what we'll see. Um, my grandmother, after World War I, as an older teenager, left Journey, traveled across the Atlantic, through Alice Island, took a train to San Francisco, all by herself. She was traveling alone. Um, in San Francisco, she joined her sister Lizzie, and they stayed with some family friends that had been friends in Germany. My grandma and Lizzie made very different choices about how to live in this country. Lizzie never learned English. She stayed in a tight German community, um, and in essence, she was a German living in the United States. My grandma decided, nope, this is where I am. She never spoke English, uh, never, she always spoke English. She never spoke German, except to Lizzie. My dad did not learn German. My dad completely lost his heritage because it was just this now. Those are two very common ways to deal with the painful reality of being a stranger in the land. And as we look at our country, we can see Christians making both of those choices, well, one or the other of them, um, as they face the reality that in fact, we are strangers in this land. We don't fit really. But Peter is calling us to make a different choice. He's calling us to door number three. That sentence that I began goes this way. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul. Wage war against your soul is a really strong image when you think about it. What is the goal of war? It is destruction. It is conquering. It's total control. These sinful desires don't want us to just cross some little line. They are out to destroy us. Now, Peter doesn't tell us what specific desires he's thinking about. And there's, there's a lot to choose from. But I would like to talk about one that I think fits this context, and that is fear. Fear tends to be what motivates door number one and door number two. We don't want to be outsiders, uncomfortable, mocked, persecuted and suffering. And all of that kind of goes with the sense of not belonging. So motivated by fear, although it might not be named, might not even be recognized, we tend to make protective choices. But honestly, protective choices are rarely wise choices in the long run. Peter says to abstain. We can't always make fear go away. However, 
we don't have to obey him. We can just invite him to join us as we do what is good and what is honorable, as we do the next right thing. Fear honestly doesn't usually hang around a long time in the arena of goodness. That is not his comfort zone. But even if he remains, you just do the next right thing again, and again, and again. And that's really Peter's next advice. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day that he visits us. We stay in that position of tension. We stay connected with our culture, with our neighbors, even though they may slander us, and we stay true to Jesus. We stay and do good, visible good things so that they can see. And those good deeds will cause them to glorify God in the day when he visits. Now, this might be the final judgment when they grudgingly have to say, yeah, I did see some good examples of Christians. Yeah, I really don't have an excuse for where I stand. But it also can be the joy-filled glorifying of God when God visits an unbeliever with salvation in a new heart. There are countless stories of people who have seen Christians suffer well and who turned and joined the Jesus way. Either way, our good deeds living in that uncomfortable tension bring glory and pleasure to our God. That, that is our door number three. Peter goes on and he gives us an example of how and why we can suffer well. But when you do good and suffer for it, endure and you endure, this is commendable, gracious thing that finds favor with our God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his footsteps. We like it when we are called to be part of a family, to be a temple, that's cool. The call to follow Jesus' footsteps through suffering is perhaps not the one we really wanted to hear. The word example in the phrase, Christ has also suffered for you, leaving you an example, has two meanings. So one of them is an example, like, <laughs> okay? The other one, the more foundational ancient meaning, was, you remember we talked about the wax tablets where they put wax over wood? It's one of those. And they would etch the letters into it. So somebody who was getting ready to learn to write would use their finger and they would trace over those letters, building muscle memory so that when they actually started to write, they were used to the feel. Exactly the same thing we do with our preschoolers. And the point is that um, as we practice living the Jesus way in our everyday life, we are building spiritual muscle memory. I, I have heard women make comments like, I, I really don't know if I could stand up under persecution. I'm, I'm kind of afraid when I think about that. But here's the deal. If you have had the habit of tracing Jesus' footsteps around your kitchen, in the car, around the store, around the town, you will be ready. That muscle memory is going to kick in, and you will stand strong. And the Holy Spirit plays a fairly important role in that as well. But if we are going to trace Jesus' ways, then we sort of got to know what they were. So how did he respond to suffering and to attack? Peter says he did not sin. There was no deceit in him. 
He did not return verbal attack with verbal attack. He didn't lash out. He did not respond with threats or retaliation. He entrusted himself to the God who judges justly. In other words, he didn't defend himself and he didn't justify himself. We don't have to be persecuted to be tempted to violate that list. In our homes, in our businesses, we have all had times when it was really challenging to try to walk in these footsteps of Jesus. And maybe we just failed. I know I, know I certainly have that. Oh, yeah, wasn't there. We are called to turn from sin and to do good. But Jesus never sinned. So maybe, maybe this was easy for him. Jesus didn't sin. But that doesn't mean he wasn't tempted to sin. The fact that he didn't act on the temptation doesn't mean he didn't see the t sin and need to turn away from it. And Peter would know. Peter spent three years in real close contact with Jesus. And in his own life, he had seen Jesus rebuke him with gentleness rather than just blast him. He had seen Jesus choose love when really impatience would have been natural. He had listened to Jesus pray for his weakness rather than reject him. And he was forgiven and reinstated after his betrayal of Jesus. Peter knew that he himself had tempted Jesus to sin. And he had only received love. We too can actually look at sin and say, Nah, I'm not going down that path. And we can trace his footsteps. But Jesus didn't just avoid sin. He did good deeds. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. Like, good deeds don't get any more good than that. And an abundance of good flowed out of that sacrifice. Peter mentions that we have died to sin and we live to righteousness. That we are healed by his wounds. Our wounds, our heart wounds, our soul wounds, our mind wounds, sometimes even our body wounds are healed because of his wounds. And we stray sheep have been returned to the shepherd and the overseer and guardian of our soul. Um, Reverend David Gobet, who is a pastor in Wales, um, gave a list of people that he knew in his own life that had really taken a hit because of their stand for Jesus. And afterwards, he made this rather disturbing comment. The only reason you would refuse to suffer for Jesus Christ is because you have forgotten where you really were and what Christ has really done for you. Let me read it again. The only reason you would refuse to suffer for Jesus Christ is because you have forgotten where you really were and what Christ has done for you. We were all sinners separated from God, separated from his love, from his beauty, from his care, from his holiness, and from his power. We were lost sheep with no direction, and no protection and no provision. We were broken people in need of so many kinds of healing. And we were stumbling under the weight of guilt and of shame. And that doesn't even count any of the eternal consequences. I'm going to give us just a brief time of silence. And I want you to think about what your life would be like now if you had never met Jesus, if you had never experienced God, if you'd never been welcomed by him, if the Spirit of God didn't indwell you, and if you had never been part of a people of God, 
So we're going to take a minute and think. Because maybe, maybe we have forgotten. For to this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you. What did it cost the king of the universe to become a few cells in the body of a woman and to be human? For the God who created all the majesty and beauty of the universe to be limited to the dusty roads of Israel? For our Creator to come and be ignored, insulted, slandered, rejected, while every day, every day continuing to love us. To bear the shame and the brutality of the cross, followed by bearing the filth of our sin and the wrath we deserved, and the separation of the Father? Have our hearts forgotten what it cost Jesus? Should we get a little bit more time of silence to move on? And remember, remember what it cost. When we hold these truths before us, then speaking up, speaking up even if it costs us being mocked, not getting the job because we won't fudge the numbers, loving that really obnoxious neighbor, forgiving the one that hurt us, accepting pain and disease and loss with grace, you know, all the different ways that we can suffer. None of those feel that big and that overwhelming anymore because we remember. Because we remember. So, yeah, take time and remember. The two principles that we saw, live where you are and bless people around you, and suffer in the pattern of Jesus, are basically the context and the foundation for the four submission passages that follow. Peter has sort of given the big picture, and then he's going to apply it to specific situations that the people in the church were dealing with. Now, three out of the four of these applications are written to people who did not have power in their settings. The state had full power over everybody. It's estimated that like 97% of the population were under the domination of one man and the 3% that kept his power rolling. 
Husbands were like emperors in their own household, and the slaves were just at the bottom of any rung you looked at. By the way, this authoritarian, authoritarian structure was how their culture was set up. It is not a biblically mandated structure. It is not how government or marriages or business have to be run. High authority is one of many ways powers can be used, but it's not the only one. In Jesus, women and slaves and the poor found dignity, love, and purpose. In the church, they all met as equals. Although, honestly, when we read the letters, we know that sometimes that's bumpy. But the question then was, how do they take this dignity back into ordinary life? How do I do that? And Peter tells them to do it by tracing the footsteps of Jesus. First, they submit to God, and they live as his servants, his slaves. And because they have submitted to God as their primary authority, then they can submit to other authorities as being secondary. Being the subject of the Roman government would have been a hard pill for the Jews in the church to swallow. The anti-Roman sentiment that we saw when we were studying the Gospels by this time has really ramped up. They are between three and five years of the beginning of the war that will lead to Jerusalem being burned to the ground, the temple destroyed, and thousands of Jews being either dead or enslaved. But notice, they are to submit and to honor for the sake of Jesus. One of the results of this obedience is they will silence foolish men. This is not naively assuming that leadership is always good and wise. We don't need to agree with everything, but to be respectful and to submit, unless the demand really defies God and his ways. And even then, we disobey with respect. We do not live in a dictatorship like they did. We should vote, as God directs, maybe do even more involvement. But we do it because God is our authority. Slaves were told to be, to be subject to and respectful for their owners, even if they didn't deserve it. In fact, this section assumes that there is going to be unjust suffering. It's not going to be fair. The discussion about how Jesus suffered was specifically aimed at the slaves, though applicable for us who are not. But they were told that, yes, you have human overseers who might actually not be good at all, but God is your true overseer. He is the guardian of your soul, and he is the shepherd who will take care of you. And that would give them the foundation they need to walk back into those very hard situations. Likewise, wives. Now, Peter's advice here is specifically to wives with unbelieving husbands. And historically, we know there would have been a lot of them in the early church. So let's set up a potential scenario on why this advice might be needed. Now remember how much power the husband has in the home. Everyone is expected to follow his rules and everyone is expected to follow his gods. So one day, the husband says, Arya, get everything together for sacrifices. We're going to join my brother's family for worship at the temple tonight. And she is like, oh shoot. What do I do? Because she doesn't want to go to the temple and worship some other god. She only wants to worship Jesus. And she wants to teach her children to worship Jesus and not take them to these kind of places. But to refuse would be to face her husband's wrath and to shame him before his family and friends. Ooh. 
That could also make him hate Jesus. At this point, he thinks this Jesus thing is just sort of a, a passing fad, and he's tolerating it. But if because of Jesus, she shames him, and she shames the family, oh, that tolerance would be gone. So what should she do? Theoretically, husbands with believing, wives with believing husbands would have less areas of conflict. Now, we all know that doesn't mean no areas of conflict. So, the principles here work whatever. And if you are single, you are still called to live with grace and inner beauty, to do good, and to trust God. None of this can kind of wiggle out of this one. Peter gives principles that need to be teased out in every setting. And the first one is to be subject to your husband with so much grace that they're going to wonder about the good changes in you. Like with the government, there are lines that we shouldn't cross. But the idea is to say yes as often as we possibly can. Loving a person is wanting what is best for them. If a person is on a violent or destructive path, then it is loving to help them get off. We have more options than first century women did. But calling the police about a violent husband is really an act of love, as well as an act of protection for the wife and the children. He needs to get off that violent path because it will eventually destroy him. And maybe it's going to take something like police to help that happen. There is nothing in the Bible that forbids that phone call. So it may not be the right choice, but it may also. We are also to focus on inner beauty over external beauty. This is not a mandate to dress ugly. Nothing to do with that. <laughs> but a real strong focus on what we wear and how we look can end up being very vain and very self-centered. It becomes all about me. It also creates a lot of anxiety and jealousy because there is always somebody who is prettier, more stylish, or younger. Inner beauty gives space to notice and to care for other people. External beauty is nice to look at, but inner beauty is much nicer to live with. And we are Sarah's children if we do good and don't fear that which is frightening. Why? Why does that make us her children? Because she looked to God as her ultimate authority. He calls us to do good, and he will protect us, or walk through the very hard times with us. The instruction to slaves and to women acknowledged the fact that in their day, they did not have power in their structure. God is a realist. He is saying, this is your situation, and this is how you live a godly life in that situation. Anywhere that we find ourselves where we realize we do not have power, these are the footsteps we trace. <clears throat> the instructions to husbands begin likewise which means this is another application. This is how husbands were supposed to trace the footsteps of Jesus. And this is actually way, way more out of the cultural accepted norm than what he said to women and to slaves. Within their homes, husbands had power, and they are being told to use that power in a very unfirst century way. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, there have always been good husbands. But on the whole, 
First century men did not spend much time thinking about what their wives wanted. Their wives were supposed to understand them. And it's pretty much a one-way street. <clears throat> Show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. <laughs> okay, wait. I am not a weaker vessel. <laughs> but that was a cultural given in their day. Both the men and the women absolutely believed. She's a weaker vessel. The only ones who didn't was Jesus and those who were trying to trace Jesus' footsteps. And because she was weaker, because she was vulnerable, the general approach is, you use them. And Peter's saying, no, 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 no. You don't use them. You honor them would have been mind-blowing to be told to do that. And they are heirs with you of the life of grace. Women were equal with men in the grace of life. Women weren't equal anywhere. Nowhere. So God is calling men to completely upend the way that they looked at marriage and the way they lived their life. And others would see that. This, of all of these things, this is the only one that has a consequence. Doesn't say that to wives and to slaves. And the consequence for refusing to live that way is that God will not answer their prayers. They have set themselves against God and he will withdraw his blessing. That's really potent. This was a very hard call. But this was how Jesus used his power. And he is calling men to use their power in the same way as he used his power. To trace his footsteps. In our day, power isn't um, anchored specifically in one gender. You all have areas where you have power. They might be small or they might be big. This is the call to use the power that we have by tracing Jesus' footsteps. This impacts how we parent, how we grandparent, how we treat employees, how we treat people in the service industry, how we act in church. Anywhere that we have power, this is the pattern that we take. Peter's letter is so practical. And this week we have seen the challenge to embrace who we truly are, not be discouraged about the church, but to walk forward in the truth and the courage of what it means to be the temple of God, the church of God. And we have been called to trace Jesus' footsteps in serving our God and serving those around us through submission and through leadership done right. May God empower us to act on this this week. Oh, Lord God, we are grateful for this message and we're honestly uncomfortable with this message. But you indwell us and I pray that you will help each of us know what to take out of it that we need to apply and to release the things that just may not fit right now. But you are our grace, God, and you indwell, and you guide and direct and empower. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>